Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, what I'm going to try to do is in 15 minutes take you through 12 years of my life. I want to start by saying that I really did not intend to, I did not set out to have a fine art career. Um, I certainly didn't intend to become an AI artist. I simply was trying to find a way to more fully convey and share with my friends and family these incredible experiences I was having in special places. I'm an avid hiker and skier and traveler, and um, I just get so wowed by some of the beauty on our planet. Uh, my attempts to capture that with traditional photography has never really um, done the right job. And, uh, and that set me on this quest. You know, I have a background in design and 3D graphics, so I had some chops to bring to the bear. And over... The last couple decades, I've been experimenting with things like HDR photography, panoramic photography, and so on, um, and also just really questioning, like, like what is, how did, how, how can I really convey the feeling that I'm having? And w there's a series of surprises that kind of came to me over the course of this project. Uh, the first of which was, you know, what the master landscape painters of the last 400 years did the, this pretty well. What, what was it that they were doing? Well, for one thing, they were painting the way they saw, not the way cameras see, because they didn't have photography, for one thing. And when you think about how humans see, we see with a much wider field of view, much more dynamic range, and sharp detail everywhere we turn. Um, so uh, back in 2011, in front of this canyon in Utah, I had this aha moment where a lot of these different techniques I was experimenting with came together by necessity because I was in front of this geological formation that there was literally no other way to capture the scene than to synthesize all these different elements and force my camera to see the world the way humans do, which, like I said, was, you know, very wide angle uh, in both directions and uh, high dynamic range and so on. So here's what I did. I realized, uh, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, this was one of those cases where a single exposure of this of this canyon didn't that much. Um, it was a, the most challenging situation you can get. I was pointing into direct light, total washout at the top. The canyon was in deep shadow. Uh, I couldn't back up far enough to take the whole thing in because there was an opposite canyon wall behind me. And one of the coolest things about actually being there is that canyon wall behind me was creating indirect, diffuse, interreflected light in the color of the canyon turning this wall electric. And how do you capture that? With my XYZ photography technique. This captured all of that. It's, uh, it's uh, basically a multi-row, high dynamic range panorama. Um, so that really started this project in earnest. I realized I, I maybe was onto something. I spent several months experimenting with this and got a lot of great response and, and, and sort of kicked off in earnest this sort of fine art career. Um, making some progress with getting uh, the feeling across of what these spaces were like. It turns out another surprise was that this pastoral landscape, um, vibrant wide angle approach was sort of very tied to the healing art aspects of representational pastoral landscapes that had a, a real uh, evidence-based uh, to it that, that, that really helped calm people. And I started having these installed in mental health centers, senior centers, and so on. And because they were so high resolution, I was shooting so many photos, I was able to make them very large and backlight them. And it was like being there. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then the uh, tech companies came along like Salesforce and started using my work as giant backdrops for their Dreamforce conference, um, uh, Toyota, uh, this is probably the biggest I've ever seen my work. I think altogether it was like 120 feet by 17 feet high or something, uh, some of my canyon work. Um, and then four or five years into this, in the summer of 2015, another surprise came along. You know, this was crazy because it was a viral phenomenon, but people forget um, that Deep Dream was not created to make art. It was not trained on art. It was part it was really a diagnostic tool for a computer vision system, Google's image recognition system that they were going to use with their consumer photos, 
was not working quite right. And one of the brilliant engineers there realized that uh, by writing this diagnostic tool, he could peek under the hood of the computer vision system and see what it was thinking. And he was shocked to see that it appeared to be hallucinating. So just for fun, he wrote a little paper, released it to open source. And for a summer, uh, people all over the world had fun turning their family photos into psychedelic nightmares. And that was about the extent of it. Uh, because the image database had a lot of animals in it, it ended up creating all these weird dog slugs and things like that. It was very bizarre. Uh, but I saw, uh, I, 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 it occurred to me, this might be a way to introduce another element into my work sort of a cognitive response, make people question what they're seeing, not unlike what the Impressionists did to some degree. Um, and by using it with a lighter touch, I was surprised to see and got really positive response that this mashup of computational photography that I was doing with the AI was a really good match. Uh, There's something about the hyper-real, wide-angle, vibrant uh, landscapes I was producing that worked really well with the dreaming styles. Um, but you know, this was a toy. It could not work on 100 to 500 megapixel images like I was producing. Um, and you know, when I was a graduate student doing 3d graphics back in the eighties, I had to code under duress in order to get my, um, <laughs> degree, but I haven't coded since. And I wasn't, I didn't have the wherewithal to do it, but fortunately I know some really smart people down here in Silicon Valley, two of whom, um, agreed miraculously to help me in their spare time uh, superscale Deep Dream for my purposes. Um, so it took them about four months of their spare time to uh, achieve liftoff. Uh, but it was really cool that I was able to take these giant images that from a distance appeared to be photographic. When you get up close, you could see there are these, you know, digital fantasies. And it was really kind of fun. Um, if any of you are in the event business, um, the guy, uh, Chris Lamb from NVIDIA, uh, got excited and said, you know, we have our GPU technology conference coming up in a few months. Uh, um, this would be great to get some of these produced for that. Uh, but we, you know, we had very little time, but amazingly, they went for it. They commissioned three of these at large scale. But before that, I was down in UC San Diego. I had my first opportunity to see these at large scale on this display at the Qualcomm Institute. Um, that was a blast. That was a lot of fun, interactively scrolling through these and zooming in and zooming out and so on. But it was literally the very next day that we installed these at the GPU Technology Conference in 2016. And that uh, produced some additional surprises. One is that um, we are all guilty of biased seeing. We don't see what actually hits our retina objectively. Um, we see what we expect to see until we can no longer deny that we're seeing something else. Uh, there was this incredible thing I noticed when people would walk up to this and think they were just seeing a photo and they get about three feet away and they would shriek like, what am I looking at here? They, you know, they totally blow them away. And I would ask them, do me a favor. Uh, now that you see what this is composed of, I want you to walk backwards until you can't see that anymore, those hallucinations anymore. And it was like another six feet back they had to go to, to not see them. They couldn't unsee it. So that meant that for that six feet span, they were not seeing what was hitting their retina. They were seeing what they expected to see. Once they knew it was there, they couldn't unsee it. Uh, so that was an interesting surprise. Um, here's an example of uh, one of the full scene dreamscapes I did. This is the Japanese tea garden here. Uh, when you get up close, you see that it's got this fine, crazy impressionist AI hallucinations going on. Um, this actually worked against me in 50% of the cases. I started getting invited to exhibit these at uh, large contemporary international art fairs, and I would lose half my audience because half the audience would walk by from a distance, think it was just a big photo, wonder why I was there, how I got in. And uh, But the 50% of people that had was enough to get close would be like, this is my favorite thing in the show. It was driving me crazy. So a couple of years later, I actually realized I could dream in multiple passes at multiple scales in multiple different styles and have my cake and eat it too and make a dreamscape that was clearly something else from a distance. But when you got close, there was yet another level of detail. By the way, this is in the um, Google office here in San Francisco. Anyone work there now on Spare Street? Anyone in here? 
If you know anyone that does, it's on the fourth floor. Uh, it's on the seventh floor. Um, they could take you and show you that. Creative seeing, that's another thing. Um, when I was in the height of my production frenzy, I started seeing these things in the real world uh, in certain lighting conditions under, um, um, you know, up in the hills of Half Moon Bay where I live. I would start to see some of these patterns and I could hold it. It was really crazy. I would tell my friends, you know, are, do you see? The, yeah, they're like, no, Dan, those are acid flashbacks. I'm like, well, maybe, but I still see them. Um, so, you know, remember, seeing is a creative act, act entirely. It happens in the visual cortex, not on our retina. And it's dark in there. It's completely dark. Everything we're seeing is happening inside there. So it's a creative act. And I, I, I assure you, other species see the world very differently from us. Certainly AIs do. Um, anyway, just to wrap it up, I've been putting more of these dreamscapes into like senior centers. This is just on, the, um, in Vallejo. Um, I have a virtual gallery on the spatial platform. If anyone has a quest or a quest two and wants to meet me in there someday, I can take you for a tour around there. It's, it's really fun. I've had openings in there with like 25 people at a time. Uh, that's a blast. I waited 40 years for that, by the way. Uh, mixed reality. I'm really excited about AR and mixed reality. I was invited by uh, an NFT outfit focused on uh, AR-based NFTs. I submitted this seven by seven foot cubic sculpture for Bryant Park in New York, geolocated there, and was able to walk inside it and look around with my phone uh, at this point. Um, people in the park wondered what the hell I was doing, but that was really kind of fun. I'm really excited about where that's going. Uh, I just had a seven and a half month solo show on Half Moon Bay that uh, was a retrospective that just wrapped up. Um, and one thing I'm really hoping to do someday, this is I have a project vision for a climate activism oriented immersive exhibition that I would love to get staged. Uh, this is as an emerging artist, not something that is up to me. Uh, I can't make that happen. I have to be asked. All I can do is put out the vision so at the bottom of my Dreamscapes portal page on my website, uh, you'll see the Project Vision page for Swan Song, uh, which is that that uh, half hour experience I'd love to stage someday to help uh, spur and inspire climate activism. So anyone that's involved in that world, get in touch. Uh, and that's it for now. It's running on a four quad GPU based compute server on the Amazon cloud. Um, and the speed with which it computes one of these big ones has literally in the years gone from 12 to 14 hours or so to 40 minutes to an hour, shockingly. Um, but early on, what hasn't changed is the engineers uh, calculated that a typical dreamscape, single pass dreamscape, does about 150 quadrillion floating point math operations just to compute one scene. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Fortunately, uh, you know, um, you know, I'm older. This is my fourth career. Um, I have some resources. So because I have to say it is my fourth and by far hardest career in terms of trying to make a living. It's almost impossible to make a living in fine art. Um, let's let's just make some definitions. Um, you know, for me, uh, fine art is making the art that you want, uh, and if you're lucky, some people buy it. Um, I'm not talking about commissioned work. I'm not talking about illustration, concept design, all those things that may, maybe many of you are involved in. Uh, that is, I think, even that's not an easy way to make a living, and. It's about to get a little harder, I hate to tell you, with what's happening with uh, AI, but I, I think there's hope for you guys. I really do. The interesting thing, in my view, is that I think like three things are required to actually make it in fine art, only one of which is under the artist's control. And the rest, the, the other two things are both like winning a lottery ticket. That's how hard it is. Uh, just in a nutshell, the first one is the only thing that, that's under your control is you got to have the goods. Your Your stuff has to uh, really, you have to have the exhibition history, the critical acclaim, the basic marketing chops. You got to have the work. Uh, that's that's pretty much all you can do. Uh, the first lottery ticket you have to win is your work has to, for some luck of timing, resonate with the zeitgeist. 
like, you know, Elvis started doing what he was doing when the country was ready to hear black music, you know, uh, and uh, the Beatles, you know, the Liverpool sound was something America was, you know, Picasso, uh, you know, uh, his his whole re- uh, delving into cubism and whatnot, uh, philosophically what was happening scientifically at the time was resonating. Uh, he got lucky. Uh, so I won that lottery ticket, um, being one of the first to use AI in art. Uh, but the next lottery ticket, which is much harder, is you need a champion, someone really influential to get behind you. It has to be their idea. And see- seeking them directly doesn't help. It won't work. Um, and uh, and that's what um, Gertrude Stein was for Picasso. That's You may argue what uh, Brian Epstein was for the Beatles. Uh, you know, uh, David Geffen for Jackson Brown. Um, that's that's another lottery ticket. And you can do things to inc- improve your luck. You know, there, there's this funny thing about the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, but um, I hope that answers your question. No, so, and this is something we should get into later as well with what's happening now w- with an AI that's actually trained on art. Um the AI that I'm using was not trained on art. It was trained on an, uh, an image database that consists of millions of people's photos. Um, but, you know, my feeling is uh, using an AI that's been trained even on art is, is kind of a fair use situation unless you're explicitly saying in the style of this particular artist. That's another situation we can talk about. Uh, but no, I don't. Um, this is... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's my work. <laughs> it's my, it's original photography. You know, uh, I shoot the images in the field, um, and the AI is, uh, you know, it's just just like like you as designers, your brain is filled with the things you've seen in museums and studied in in art history class and so on. You know, it's basic guys look at it the same way. I would list three real quick. Uh, one would be Frederick Edwin Church, who was, I think, the most skilled and greatest of the representational landscape painters. He was uh, Thomas Cole, who started the Hudson River School. He was his one student. Um, he did an incredible work, uh, and what he and, and at grand scale. The heart of the Andes in the museum of uh, in the Metropolitan Museum is something that must not be missed. Every time I'm in, in New York, I make a pilgrimage to it. Um, and by the way, that was an immersive experience. He actually put that out there as a single painting exhibition that people paid admission to see under lights. They were, they were seats, they gave you opera glasses and it was a whole deal, not unlike what I'm trying to create. Um, so very inspired by him. Um, Maxfield Parrish, who in the early 1900s was America's most, one of the most beloved illustrators, um, in his later life decided he was done with that and he just became a landscape artist and he was an incredible tinkerer he brought old and new techniques together to create amazingly luminous landscape paintings that super inspire me uh and then does anyone know ivan de earl the disney background artist and and what he produced if you're ever in carmel go to the ivan de earl gar- gallery um this guy was like a mystic um he he had a vision for, and, and, and he was also a poet. He, he had a vision for landscape and, you know, luminous landscape experiences and a style that was so unique. Um, I, I just, he's the third inspiration for sure. There's two sides to that. The core software has not changed at all. Um, I'm using the same code base, but I continue to tap its potential and haven't haven't reached the end of it yet. Um, so in the years that I've been working with it, I've gone from doing single pass dreamscapes to multi pass dreamscapes to experimenting with, um, you know, cubist uh, um, motifs, uh, abstract dreams. If you if you look on my dreamscapes gallery page, you'll see some of these experimentations. I did a whole collection called Dream Noir, which was inspired by the graphic novels of Frank Miller, 
where the dreamscapes are all in basically black and white and one color. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just keep experimenting with these things. Um, you can see the variety on, on, on the dreamscapes page. And by the way, the shortcut for my dreamscapes portal page is just dreamscapes.ai. Easy to remember, go there, you'll see what I'm... So my first career was in architecture. My first degree was in architecture. I, I stayed on at Cornell for a master's in 3D graphics. Um, in the early 80s, I made the mistake, I think, of trying to set the architecture world on fire with the amazing 3D graphics visualization tools we were using at Cornell. And it was like going back in the time machine and trying to shake these architects to drop their pencils and start using computers. It was an exercise in frustration. I was too early. It was like pushing on a rope. But I lasted 10 years in the field working for one of the largest architecture firms up in Seattle, MBBJ, uh, while my friends down here in Silicon Valley were having the times of their lives working for Silicon Graphics and Industrial Light and Magic and so on. So in the mid-90s, um, I made a career transition uh, with the help of my former colleagues into SGI, uh, Silicon Graphics, as in, in marketing, you know, um, with my background in design and, and graphics, uh, I, I have got a lot of communication skills, both visually and verbal and so on. So it was, a, it was one of the ways, if you're going to make a career transition, it's easiest if it's something that's like one foot over and then you can bring the other foot. Well, um, so after 10 years of um, basically doing director of marketing type roles at SGI and, and four different uh, startups, uh, that increasingly drifted from the core passion of 3D graphics into, you know, streaming video and, you know, so on. Um, my wife and I became uh, independent marketing consultants, so we became small business owners. And for 20 years or so, we were doing uh, marketing communications projects, uh, a lot of event marketing and so on, um, uh, on a project by project basis. And that gave me some flexibility to pursue this uh, art thing. So since 2011, I was kind of burning the candle at both ends, and then COVID hit, and uh, and and our business was doing really well. We had, uh, which isn't always the case with uh, independent marketing consulting, um, but we were having a really good year. And in the space of three weeks, we lost all of our our entire project. And, you know, thankfully with the pandemic assistance, we were able to get on unemployment for a little while. And I could focus. I just bought a brand new iMac. I just taught myself Adobe After Effects. And uh, early on, like in April, when we were in hard lockdown, um, I was at part of a of um, a crypto art um, event. I, well, it wasn't. They were going to call it the Crypto Art and Digital Art Fair, but the banks wouldn't lo loan them any money, so it got changed to Contemporary Art. Uh, but there was this crypto thing going on that I wasn't really clued into, but it was my second time um, exhibiting with them. And this one night while I was stuck in this apartment we were renting in Tahoe, I just went deep down the rabbit hole and um, realized, wow, I want to be part of this. This is a way to authenticate natively digital artworks for the first freaking time. Uh, so I, within 48 hours, applied to Super Rare, uh, got on. Uh, this is back in 2000, um, 2020, so quite a while ago, three years ago, and have since been invited onto a number of other uh, curated uh, NFT platforms, uh, and that's a whole other conversation to have, which we won't go into. But I've been, from that point, just focused on the art entirely. I told my wife, I'm four years older than you, four years from now, you can retire from <laughs> marketing, but uh, I'm just totally focused on, the, I've been totally focused on the art since... COVID, basically.